In the last video, I talked about companies harvesting your data, what they can do with it, intentionally or unintentionally, and what you can do to limit it. However, we're still far from over, because governments can collect your data as well. Your mind may be immediately thinking of China and other authoritarian governments, but government surveillance is happening all over the world. I don't even have to talk about China's extreme social credit system or use of surveillance to detain the Uyghur Muslim ethnic minority, because surveillance is happening right here in the United States. So today, let's take a deep dive into what kind of government surveillance and data collection is going on in this country and why it is so problematic. One major example of prominent government surveillance is with facial recognition. Many airports in the United States have begun to verify travelers' identities with facial recognition technology, and the practice is rapidly becoming more widespread. However, the process is diff difficult to opt out of, with travelers sometimes not even being informed that opting out is even an option, and who knows for how long it even will be an option. At first, it might seem nice to be able to get through the airport more quickly. However, the problem with fa airport facial recognition is that it creates a slippery slope for the government to utilize facial recognition more and more. As of now, Customs and Border Protection say they want to protect privacy and use the technology solely for security and convenience. They claim that the photos are deleted after 12 hours and that they don't store any identifiable information about tra travelers. But there's really no reason to be assured that they will continue to follow these p principles in the future. For example, the Department of Homeland Security, which is the umbrella department that runs the Customs and Border Protection Agency, has been shown in the past to collect and utilize social media profiles of immigrants as part of the process of determining their visa status. Of course, these profiles are very much subject to interpretation and leave the door wide open for surveillance and targeting of religious and ethnic minorities or really anyone who matches a particular descriptions or holds a particular set of beliefs. And there are many other purposes that surveillance tools, such as the one being used in airports, could be used for, including, for example, using the photos they capture to supplement their existing database of photos from driver's licenses, criminal photos, and more. And these could have the potential to be shared with law enforcement at the federal, state, and local levels. Or they could use cameras in the airport to identify people who they flag as criminals, which is especially problematic due to inaccuracy, particularly for minorities, as I'll explain shortly. And in addition to governments conducting their own surveillance, they can join forces with private companies too, like at least 400 local police departments across the United States who have partnered with Ring, the Amazon-owned video doorbell system, for the purposes of obtaining video footage of potential criminal suspects. Now you may ask, well what do I have to worry about? I'm not a criminal, I have nothing to hide. Well, first of all, once the government has enough data on individuals to justify punishing people for certain behaviors observed with surveillance technology, they could arrest or punish you based on misidentification of who you are or what behaviors you have actually engaged in. As I mentioned before, facial recognition technology is often inaccurate for minorities, and it perpetuates and exaggerates the existing biases that humans already have. The National Institute of Standards and Technology, a U.S. government agency, found last year that among algorithms from 99 developers of facial verification and identification algorithms across the world, many produced false positive rates 10 to 100 times higher on faces of American Indians, Africans, and with the notable exception of some of the Chinese-made algorithms, East Asians, when compared to Eastern European individuals. And false positive rates are also higher for women than men, and for the elderly and children compared to middle-aged people. In 2018, the ACLU ran a test of Amazon's recognition AI on U.S. Congress people and found that a full 5% of them supposedly matched the photos of people arrested for a crime, and a disproportionate number of them were people of color. The ACLU of Northern California repeated a similar test with state legislators and got a match rate of one in every five lawmakers. Now, the ACLU decided to count anyone as a match if they met an 80% confidence threshold, which was the default setting for the software at the time. Amazon has since said that for law enforcement purposes, 95% should be used as the threshold instead, and they've since upped that recommendation to 99%. However, 
Amazon's first known law enforcement customer, the Washington County Sheriff's Office in Oregon, does not use any confidence threshold at all, as the system is intended to be used simply to find potential suspects that should be investigated further manually. And Amazon, strangely, did not take any issue with this use case. Similarly, in Detroit, the police chief admitted that if the facial recognition software they use, which is not from Amazon, were used as the sole method of identifying the perpetrator of a crime, it would misidentify people as a match around 96% of the time. So, okay, we just have to make sure that facial recognition is only used as a first step in investigating a crime. Problem solved, right? Well, let's take a look at the story of Robert Williams, an African-American man who may be the first person improperly arrested in the U.S. on the basis of facial recognition. In January of 2020, that very same Detroit Police Department took an investigative lead from the state police, what was supposed to be a list of possible matches upon which more investigative work should have been conducted, and instead simply compiled it into a lineup of six photos for a loss prevention firm working on a shoplifting case to choose among to identify as the perpetrator of that crime. And the humans who were conducting this manual review were not eyewitnesses, they were basing their identification on the same surveillance footage that was being fed into the facial recognition algorithm. Solely based on this procedure was Robert Williams arrested. And you may suggest that this is more a case of incompetence, where officials used tools which are ultimately helpful if used correctly and simply misused them. But it's too simple. Having access to such vast amounts of data opens the door for police and other law enforcement and government agencies to cut corners and misuse these tools. It is bound to happen. Now, when cameras don't have facial recognition technology built in, the question of whether they are harmful is admittedly harder to answer. On the one hand, with poor oversight and inadequate guidelines set up in advance, regular cameras too can be misused and taken advantage of. However, they could help in some cases to find the true criminal of a crime quickly and accurately, so long as the cameras have good enough quality and a proper look at the action. You could again make the argument, though, that law enforcement can use the increased data they have to justify taking action when the data is not actually very good or the officers have an ulterior motive. But then again, you can argue that without cameras, you must rely on eyewitnesses instead, who can skew the truth even easier. I personally think that, in theory, cameras with enough oversight could be used strategically and carefully as corroboration of other evidence. But again, it's a difficult question, because one day the government might decide to use the camera infrastructure that's already in place to start a more robust surveillance system than had ever originally been intended. In San Diego, for example, streetlights with cameras installed on them are in place around the city, Though they were originally billed as a way to monitor transportation for better city planning, now the police can access the camera footage in the event of a major crime, the definition of which has shift shifted over time and may continue to do so. Ultimately, I'd say that even with no AI or other automated technology instituted as part of a particular surveillance system, the risk that arises with the ease of such systems being misused after the fact is just too great to merit mass surveillance being a positive addition to our society. And when it comes down to it, you never really know what the government will one day define as illicit behavior. And when they have a historical record of so much that each person has done, it makes it easy for whoever is in power to go after the whatever people they want. For example, it's not too dif difficult to imagine an administration similar to the previous Trump administration, using technology to go after illegal immigrants or minority groups, suggesting that they're likely to be terrorists. Or if you're on the other side of the aisle, think of the government going after people who say certain things online that a theoretical liberal administration decides is hateful and or harmful. Although you may personally be in favor of one of these two situations occurring, the fact is that it is all too easy for the other side to gain control and flip the script to fit their agenda. Having data creates power, and that power is guaranteed to be seen as abused by a significant portion of the population, one way or the other. 
That is, unless, of course, the government goes so far to control society that there's no one left resisting such technology's use at all. And because there is reason to fear that whatever you're doing at any moment may be used against you, you always have to assume that it will. Like prisoners in the 18th century panopticon, you must always assume you are being watched. There is no easy method to know what information the government is collecting, and even when there are transparency laws in place, it is nearly inevitable that there will be something more going on a level deeper, behind what is available knowledge for citizen oversight. And being in constant fear is no way for innocent people to live in a society that claims to be protecting those very innocent citizens by keeping close tabs on dangerous ones. The increase of surveillance and data collection is often a gradual process, making it easy for us to accept the incremental changes and pass it off as just the way the world is nowadays. But as privacy and data security expert Professor Daniel Solov puts it, although society is more likely to respond to a major oil spill, gradual pollution by a multitude of actors often creates worse problems. Now, this portion of the video doesn't have as much of a simple conclusion as the suggestions I offered in my previous video about protecting your privacy with private companies. Government data collection is simply far more difficult to escape than that of private companies. But if you can, vote, and always advocate for your beliefs and your rights that deserve to be protected. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider leaving a like, subscribe if you don't want to miss out on future uploads, and please, consider sharing this video to spread the word if you think others would benefit or learn from this information. Also, this video's script, complete with comprehensive source citations and additional commentary throughout the entirety of the video, is available in the description, so please check that out for a much deeper look at much of the content in this video. I spend a long time writing, writing these annotated strips in order for the videos to be of, of the highest factual quality and accuracy. So I sincerely appreciate you taking a look. And as always, if you think I missed something, or if you have any other comments, leave them below or send me an email. But anyways, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time. Goodbye.